All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Newberry. Uh, we have a exciting panel coming up here in which we are not talking about every item in the show. I hope you went to see it. Uh, uh, it will be uh, open again after uh, after we talk. There's also the last uh, the last evening uh, and then one more day of the uh, companion exhibition uh, is on on view in the um, sort of secondary gallery. So if you haven't seen that, um, that's coming to a close, sadly. Yep, there's, there we are. We've been seeing a lot of the whale. We'll be seeing much less in a minute. Okay, so I will, we're including the question, the question and answer number uh, under almost all the slides. So if you have a question, please do send it to us uh, via that number. Yep, hopefully everyone is, is all set to listen to us. Uh, you know, give us, give us a wave if we need to hold the microphone a little higher or something like that. All right. So we have a one, wonderful group of, uh, of artists and uh, art historians here. So Sean Sheehy has been teaching book arts courses and workshops on the national level since 2001. His broadsides and artist book editions have been collected by such, such prestigious institutions as the Newberry Library, hooray, uh, Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, University of Chicago, Library of Congress, UCLA Special Collections, Yale, Brown, and Harvard. His pop-ups have been featured twice in both hand paper making uh, magazine and vintage magazine. Uh, Sean's trade pop-up book, Welcome to the Neighborhood, a mass market version of his artist book, was released in 2015, winning numerous awards. The mass market version of his artist book, Beyond the Sixth Extinction, was released through Candlewick in October 2018. He has served as the director of the Movable Book Society since 2018, and I urge you to consider joining. Wonderful, wonderful group. Uh, and he has served as the uh, conference chair since 2014. He holds an MFA in uh, book arts from Columbia College, Chicago. Uh, Sean creates artist books and other paper engineered ephemera with an ecological bent. He dedicates his artistic practice to contemplating the cultural impacts of human wild relationships. Okay. Uh, we, and next to him is Hannah Batzel, a Chicago-based book artist, writer, and illustrator. She received her BFA in printing and book arts from the University of Georgia in, in 2011, and her MFA in the same, um, in the same uh, area from Columbia College, Chicago, in 2016. Her award-winning limited edition artist book work can be found in special collection libraries and museums across the country, including the Newberry. Uh, you've seen a couple of them in the show. Her first children's book, A is for Another Rabbit, was published in 2020, and her second, The Night of Little Import, will be released this September. I'm really looking forward to that one, which is why we have the uh, author portrait there. But you'll have to wait until fall of 2025 to read her first mass-produced pop-up book for adults. She is involved with several bookish organizations, including the Caxton Club and Artist Book House, which seeks to build a center for the book and literary arts here in Chicago. Her work focuses on power, magic, and exploration. Okay, on the far left, uh, we have Juliette Sperling, Assistant Professor of Art History and Kohler Endowed Chair in American Art in the School of Art and Art History and Design at the University of Washington. It's wonderful she could be with us uh, this evening. Uh, for the 2022 to 23 academic year, she is a Barbara Tom long-term fellow at the Huntington Library, where she's completing a book about the role of touch in experiencing, understanding, and creating art in the United States during the long 19th century, tentatively titled Tactile Encounters in American Art. And what, you know, what would pop-up books be if we couldn't touch them, right? Uh, her scholarship on interactive books and prints has appeared in venues including American Art, Early American Studies, and most recently, the volume Model Work, uh, The Material Culture of Making and Knowing, University of Minnesota Press 2021. Uh, Sperling is uh, Chair Emerita of the Association of Historians of American Art and a Senior Fellow and Founding Member of the Andrew W. Mellon Society of Fellows in Critical Bibliography. Okay, finally, I'm Suzanne Karschmidt. Uh, the first female George Amos Poole III curator of rare books and manuscripts at the Newberry, and the first movable book mad curator, or, or sorry, and the movable book mad curator of pop up books through the ages. I have published widely on interactive printing and hybrid books in pre modern Europe. Uh, I became a Newberryan in March 2017, prior to which I was a curator in prints and drawings at the Art Institute of Chicago. 
Some of you may have seen my exhibitions there, most notably Altered and Adorned, Using Renaissance Prints in Daily Life in 2011. During the early pandemic, I co-curated Renaissance invention, Stradonis' Nova Aperta at the Newbury with Leo Markey, though sadly few people can, uh, can attest to the fact that we borrowed both a cannon and a suit of armor uh, for it. All right, uh, we have a few equally interesting uh, book objects on view now, so I hope you'll also take another look at the show after the panel if you haven't already. Okay, so let's get, I'm gonna be lightly moderating. So uh, we are going to start with a question, uh, which is, are pop-up books art? All right, let's start with uh, Sean and Hannah. Anybody wanna jump in? How about now? Oh, all right. A little higher. Okay, our pop-up books are not to um, come at it with the easiest possible answer that everyone knew I was gonna say, but yes, obviously they are. Um, yes, yes. I think everybody who has taken like an art 101 class in any college has had to answer the what is art question at least one to 99 times. Um, so I, I don't want to get too far into that because we could be here all night. But I think that um, pop-up books are a type of art that has come under a lot of types of stigma, um, something we were talking about earlier, the stigma of it being a novelty, of it being a gimmick, of it being for children. Um, it's, a, it's a type of art that I think deserves uh, a little more credit than it's due. Um, what do you think? It's curious if you look at books that have been published uh, 30 years ago or more that you'll frequently see author credits on the cover, you'll see illustrator credits on the cover, you will not see paper engineer credits on the cover. You know, that's frequently just someone who is involved with the publishing company who is doing work in the background. So in that whole wider area of, you know, what's art, what's creditable, who's gonna get paid attention to. Uh, engineers have been, you know, they've been behind the curtain for sure. But, you know, it's a, it's a job that is structural and mechanical, but also sculptural. So building shape and form in an artful way is, is pivotal. I'm gonna just... chime in on that one too, actually. Um, I, I think Hannah and Sean's books are art. I teach them in my art history classes, but I'd go a step further and say that pop-up books are art history, and we actually can't understand some art without them. They help us understand things about paintings and sculptures that we wouldn't otherwise if we weren't looking at things that were you know, made to be engaged with in a way that isn't just visual. I think there's another age old question kind of tied into this too, which is what is the difference between craft and art? And craft so often gets relegated to a, a sub art level um, when really all of the same skills, all of the same context and thoughtfulness goes into um, craft media, just as it goes into artistic media. Um, often, you know, sometimes for gendered reasons and sometimes for, uh, kind of respectability reasons historically. Um, so yeah, I'm very firmly in the, it is art camp. People get trained up into it. <clears throat> Example, uh, was teaching a workshop this past weekend for high schoolers and uh, basically teaching rote structure and finished a model, students were working along with me, student who was sitting next to me uh, was struggling with it, and she said, um, I don't really do this crafty stuff. I'm more of a 2D person. So yeah, it starts, it starts with the young people. I've had people uh, criticize my work by saying it's kind of Michael Z. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Michael Z, like the craft store, Michael's? And I said, well, I bought most of the materials from Michael, so I, I'm not surprised. <laughs> Michael's. Yeah. 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 Julia, do you want to talk about the level of, like, the quality of materials in 19th century pop-ups? And would you say those are high? 
Well, I, I was just thinking, I mean, they aren't always supposed to be art, right? They, I, I, if you were to look at some of the things that were made even before 1800, you say these were definitely not for children. They were made to teach, I mean, how many of you have been to the exhibit already? You've seen things that were made to teach people how to understand astronomy or astrology, or there aren't any anatomical things in this exhibit, right, Well, there's, well there, no, there's some, there's, there's an eyeball and okay. uh, the salius, uh, so anatomy mannequin, awesome. you know, where you, you know, pin the tail on the, you know, organs. Oh, fantastic. I, I flew in from LA this afternoon. I'm going tomorrow. I'm excited to see it. But yeah, these are things that weren't meant to be um, received as a painting would be or a sculpture would be. They were meant to teach science or meant to teach math even. And sometimes they were made with materials that we would recognize as fine, like, beautiful papers and beautiful pigments. And sometimes if you go look at them in an archive like the Newberry that will let you handle them, you'll find they could be crumbling under your hands because they were meant to be, they, don't do those, don't, don't touch those and don't crumble them under your hands, but they were meant to be used in a schoolroom in 1800 and probably not passed down through the generations and put in an archive like this. Uh, however, I would counter that with there are different levels of, uh, of do-it-yourself book. Uh, for instance, the big dragon on the front of the exhibition, uh, the sort of dial where they're eating the sun and creating eclipses, those were all hand-painted, sometimes they were gilded, they were definitely given in a fancy copy to uh, the whole Holy Roman Emperor at the time, I think that was meant to be art and that that was also meant to be a big money maker for the uh, the owner and most of those actually survived because they were so so god darn fancy. So um, I, I don't know, I mean maybe, so I have to say we, 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 we did get some, uh, a generous amount of national endowment for the arts funding for this exhibition, uh, some of which did go towards the, um, the pop-up Newberry. So I, 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 I am strongly in the corner of, uh, of this, is, uh, this time has come. So, um, so there is that. So, um, so but when you know, the didactic element is one that maybe we should talk about though, because I mean, can't, can't you have art and learn from it at the same time? I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe if you don't know you're doing it, right? So, uh, so yeah, so, so let's just take a quick look at ways that this, this particular group have tried to integrate uh, pop-ups into other contexts. Uh, so I, I, I have been using the secret decoder ring for a very long time. That, that's me on the left uh, cutting up my own personal copy of my own personal written book. Uh, yes, which, uh, yes, it's, it's not, not a Newberry one. And, uh, but you know, if you buy a copy, uh, you can uh, build it, but you can also use it on the, um, the image on the left. Uh, there's a much, very large blown up version in the gallery that you can uh, you know, decode a very silly little, little phrase, but you also have, the originals are very often not constructed. Uh, so it's, you know, when, you know, is it, is it useful to have, have this diagram that you can put together in a otherwise fairly, fairly scholarly attempt to look at all of interactive printmaking up to 1700, uh, you know, or, or is it just more fun to have a really big version you can, you know, attempt to break in a gallery? I think it's fun. I think, I think both, both have their, their uses. So, so uh, Juliet, do you want to talk about yours? Where did, where did you manage to sneak in, uh, you know, the, the extra pages that people can make them? Yeah, so what Suzanne's showing you up here on the screen is something I'm very proud of. This is a do-it-yourself, fold-your-own turn-up or metamorphosis. This is a, a type of interactive or movable book that was really popular in the 18th and 19th centuries. And it, it was included in an article that I recently published in the journal American Art. And I, I would say it's scholarly for that reason, but it's also really sneaky because you look at this and you think, okay, that's simple. That's a single sheet. It's folded like twice. It has six cuts. That's it. I understand how this thing works. But the, the quickest test to see how sneaky, complex pop-up books are is to try to explain how they work in writing. Like sit down and try to explain how this thing operates. And by operates, I don't mean like, mechanically, like the, the things that Sean and Hannah make are so mechanically complex, they're, they're hard to operate in that way, but I mean like, 
operates in terms of how it makes its meaning, how it makes you move your hands and your eyes and your brain all together to get across some kind of message. And try to write that down. It is, it's so hard to understand. So luckily my editor, after passing this article back and forth, realized that too, that it's, it's really hard to communicate, even something that looks so simple. And let me include something that you, the reader, could pull out and make yourself and fold alongside reading my argument and understand it as an interactive thing, not just an intellectual thing. And I know you both have um, been able to, to do similar things I'd love to hear about. It's interesting for me to hear you talk about describing how to operate things because uh, I spend the lion's share of my time telling people how to make things. So there's a sort of similar uh, challenge there, but it's assembly rather than operation. Um, and also I regularly get the request to write instructions out and publish them along with a kit, you know, for example, or to make a how-to book. There's a couple of those out in the world. And I think, oh, I don't want to do that. Uh, <laughs> talking about it is, is just fine. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it requires a specific language and uh, order of thinking and, um, yeah, and some good, good strategy. Yeah, and, and to add to that, we think about interacting today in one way, but interactivity is something that's part innate and part taught. And the way that people interacted with things in 1800 and 1700 is not natural. So like, think if somebody from 1800 came up here today and tried to, um, to swipe through one of our phones, they wouldn't know how to do those finger movements without some teaching. And we have to learn how to use these, these older touch screens too. So adding in those instructions, you have to get out of your own kind of contemporary mindset and think how would a person who was taught totally differently construct or move or look at this thing is, um, it's tough. So I'm gonna grab this ball and I'm gonna throw it to Suzanne because um, for the instructions that were included on the exhibition souvenir that you can see here, I wrote those directions and and did the photography and then shared it with Suzanne and her crew and I believe they eliminated half of the photos, you know, immediately <laughs> just because, you know, I wanted to make sure that it was super clear and Suzanne's like, oh, it's clear. <laughs> We're okay. We're okay. So, so what about like how with some of the earlier historical stuff, um, and instructions were given for assembly and photography wasn't included, how did, how did that go down? Yeah, I mean, you really didn't have this much information about what goes where. I, in a lot of contexts, you'd have just a sheet with the parts and some blanks elsewhere. Often you were lucky if it even gave a page number where, where the, uh, the dials are supposed to go, like in the, the 16th century decoder ring. Uh, but in that case, they're all the same size, so it didn't matter if you got the wrong page. Uh, but in this case, I mean, when I, I thought one of the, the most useful back and forth we had about the instructions on this was when I, th I think there was a, you know, glue parts, you know, two to eight together or, or tape them. And I was sort of, wait, what are, you know, are we not? are we not using glue to put the dial in? And that was number one, and it was sort of, okay, wait, actually we are, but you know, that was, I, I think there are a lot of instructions in you know, 16th century where you don't have all the right information. So being able to have a few test runs to see, well, how does this actually go together was so, was so key. Uh, yeah, Hannah, do you have any thoughts about? What? Yeah, I was just thinking I'm currently working on a mass market movable book, kind of pop-up book, and I'm writing, illustrating, and paper engineering it. And I have been communicating with my editors and publishers through email um, for the writing and the illustration, and they will not even listen to me in writing about the paper engineering. They're like, every time you talk about the structure, send us a video and then mail us a model. We're not gonna read an email. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so every iteration of the movable pop-up pieces, it, it's a physical thing getting mailed to the publisher. They look at it, they send me a video saying, we're not sure what this piece does, or can we, can we you know, tailor this piece? Um, 
and it's me sending a video back to them saying, here's why I, I can't, or like, yeah, sure. So every other part of this book process is email only, but they won't even touch it with the, the pop-up parts. <laughs> Does Chronicle have, uh, I'm gonna go off in the weeds for a second, uh, technical stuff. Does Chronicle have like a production specialist who's interfacing? Yeah, yeah they have a production team. So, um, this is the, the publisher I'm working with, Chronicle. Um, so the writing and the illustration is kind of going through a writing editor, and then the pop-up stuff is a completely different group of people, a production team who's working with the printer and you know, kind of uh, helping to polish the designs I'm sending, sending over to them. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't think that the, the team separation is the reason I think they just don't want to have to read my technical writing. <laughs> But it's not just that your, your technical writing isn't good, it's that interactive pop-up materials are made that way because they're communicating some kind of complex concept or idea that doesn't lend itself to two-dimensionality or stillness. So what are the kinds of slippery subjects that you find need to be conveyed in this interactive form, that like these inherently tough things to describe in text that need movement, need interaction? Yeah, I, I think that, um, at least for me in my work, that I'm often using uh, movable pieces or, or pop-up structures to um, animate something in the book and to, to bring a sense of wonder and surprise and an unexpected element. And for that reason, since I'm trying to kind of be unexpected and, and um, to animate something in the world of the book, whereas people may not be used to a book doing those things, um, it is difficult to describe to people because, in writing, I guess, because it's trying to be something that hasn't been done before, if that makes sense. Um, I think that uh, when I'm designing pop-up or movable elements, I'm trying to, to kind of keep it within the world of the book, so, um, Sean has talked about this before, and I, he who does a lot of work with animal pop-ups, but how you were saying a kangaroo jumping across the page is so much more evocative than, um, for example, his example is a, a table, you know, uh, popping up in a book. Because of course, a, a real world table isn't going to assemble itself like that before your eyes, but a kangaroo really will jump that way. Um, so I think that I, I really try to do that as well in my own work, um, is to keep the movement of the pop-up and the structure of the pop-up evocative of the real movement of that thing in the book. Um, and as for which subjects or which, which content is better or worse or inappropriate or appropriate for pop-ups, um, I think it's all, it's all fair game. I'll, I'll make pop-ups of anything. <laughs> and for me, it just, it satisfies the noodly part of my brain, you know, like like Suzanne mentioned in the introduction, uh, I'm super interested in considering ecology and environmental um, thinking. And so and so I'm building books of uh, ecological communities and, uh, you know, it's, it's animals. Um, that's like half of the books that I've done. So it's interesting to play with the the structure of the, it's interesting to play with the movement of it, but it also just feeds right into building creatures that are moving in interesting ways. So it's convenient, yeah. Should I jump into talking about? Um, yeah, maybe I, I put up a couple of DIY sort of comparisons. I think we were we wanted to, to look at how that may have evolved. We certainly have a lot more text in some of the things like the 16th century anatomies. This is yeah, this is one one topic that uh, you know Juliet mentioned there are some things that work fairly well with layers. So you know basically skin. Um, I mean one of the one of the things about the notes I like in this one Andreas Vesalius who was an unique and and starting to look for look at actual bodies for what was there? Uh, he he does actually talk about if you're going to put cut out the the organs on um, on the um, on the right hand side to put them on the body. It helps if you uh, you know, back them with either parchment, which is another kind of skin, animal skin, or, um, or or paper to make them more durable. So there are there are some concerns about you know ephemerality uh, in this period as well. 
Um, I know, Sean, how, how long were you, do you expect your flowers to last? Certainly longer than real ones, right? For sure, for sure. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, we were talking earlier about scholarly ideas and um, the primary reason why I threw this slide into our mix this evening was to talk about instruction and the fact that paper engineered were books uh, books were used in instructional ways for a long time. Suzanne and Juliet would have lots of interesting things to say about that. Um, but currently, uh, you can't find an institution that's granting degrees in paper engineering. There's just, there's not enough demand for it. There's not enough interest in it. So most paper engineers are autodidacts. And um, then there's folks like me, and I'm not the only one, but we are a rare bird, um, a rare flock, uh, that, that, that teach it, that teach the material. And so what you see here is, is basically just a model and then the pattern set that's used to build the model, which is basically what I'm putting in front of people when it's time to put something together, along with the careful instruction. Right. Yeah, I think to your point about kind of being self-taught, um, I was probably uh, learning how to do a lot of paper engineering stuff um, in a similar way that Juliet and Suzanne are looking at these uh, special collections materials for their own work. Um, I did a, a book for the University of Florida where I went and looked at their special collections um, and looked especially a lot at the work of Lothar Megendorfer, who's a, a very influential, kind of the grandfather of movable books. Um, and fortunately for me, unfortunately for the collection, but a lot of those books were kind of falling apart and therefore their mechanisms were exposed. Um, so I could go to their libraries and look at these books whose pages were kind of half missing and see how the sausage was made inside and take notes about how the, the, the pieces were moving. And um, it was a very uh, reverse engineering sort of way to learn how to make movable parts. Um, and I wonder how, how well that translates to what you two do with your historical research. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've had to make models of a lot of things just to try to figure out how they work, especially if parts are missing and trying to think, think about, you know, is this is this dial supposed to go here? You know, if it's missing, what what you know what would have gone here? There there are examples where you don't have anything surviving that's complete, and uh, there's a, a fair amount of creativity involved in saying, well, they made these other five things. You know, what would they have done here? I mean, in some cases, you're literally getting dials. Uh, on both sides of a page with a hole cut in the middle and a cardboard core that you glue you know, through the page to either side. So even just thinking about you know, early modern people sewing a book together, but through the pages, not through, through the, um, where, where you're actually binding the, the book together is, is sort of a, it's, it's, it's again more sculptural, it's many layered, but you're just not going to get all the parts surviving. One of, one of my favorite 16th century broadsides says, well, you know, you can use, uh, you can use a metal piece here, or you can use the paper dial that we, you know, reluctantly supplied it with because we really don't think it's going to last. So, you know, there's people talking about, you know, demand, but also that it's really not going to be durable all the way, all the way along. Yeah, Julia, have you, have you recreated anything for research? Oh, yes, very badly. My, my desk right now is covered with things that I've, I've tried to reverse engineer terribly, but I'm thinking about that question in a little bit of a different way. Like the, what the slipperiness of movable books as a research category has like, afforded me as a researcher. So when I write about paintings, I can go to things called catalog resumes, where there's two giant volumes of every painting that this artist has ever made, and you know where it is, and there's archives to document it. Or if you're writing about a certain kind of rare book, there are bibliographies for those kinds of things. That does not exist for movable books. What exists are people. So I met Suzanne very early on in my dissertation research ages ago. She was a curator at the Art Institute back then, and she had written this wonderful dissertation about the earlier part of my topic. And I found out where things were because she had seen them before. And she said, oh, this 
pop-up book. It's cataloged under this subject. It doesn't have anything in the catalog that says it has mechanical features, but I know it's there. You should go look at it. And my research has been built on people with the help of people like Suzanne, these curators who are living with collections, who know where to find things. So there's a kind of human element to it that I really appreciate. I, I hope that my book, when it's finally published, makes things a little bit easier for future researchers, but I don't want that part to go away. And when I hear you both talk about how you've had to kind of scrappily learn this engineering, I imagine there's a lot of calling up your colleagues in the field and say, like, how would you engineer this weird idea that I have? Like, what could I look at? Do you find that that's the case? For sure. Um, uh, but you said something interesting that I'm gonna expand uh, real quick too. I mean, going back to the idea of scholarship and how uh, we don't really have an academic place for the training of paper engineers, but we really don't have a great academic place for the scholarly side, for the study, for the categorization. It's getting um, better. What's that? There, there's, there's more people in, into it, okay, but, but there's more, more to be done. Plenty, and there are, there are a lot of topics that have been more thoroughly covered, <laughs> for sure. Um, there, was a, there was a conference uh, that Suzanne and I both attended virtually. Mm, 2020, 2020, the Italian conference. 2021, yeah, they, they, they bumped it a year. 2021. Um, and one of the presentations uh, was about words and how there, there doesn't exist a system of vocabulary for paper engineering because it hasn't been systematized. It hasn't had a scholarly treatment. And so the woman who gave the presentation, German, French, mm, maybe French, maybe French, I'm not sure. and it's and it's an Italian conference. Um, so there's folks attending from all over the place, and she just had a slide that was a giant word cloud of, you know, in any one of these languages, no one has settled on one word for a thing, but then over a range of languages, you know, multiply that times, you know, x. So. Yeah, more problems. Yeah, no, we really ran into questions about what do you call a you know a volvel, which is sort of a calculating dial versus a dial, which is like a clock, but in Spanish, because we we have been consistently um, having you know bilingual exhibitions at the Newberry, and it was a real back and forth with the translator because she wanted to get it absolutely right, but but there are the terminology just isn't necessarily there. You know, we had to, the, the globe gores, the elongated strips they used to make the, you know, the, the, the 3D sphere, that that was very difficult, especially to, to translate. So um, yeah, you, yeah, that's not something that like, Google Translate is gonna help you with in other, you know, no matter what language you try it, it's, you really have to have experts thinking about, you know, is it, are they animated books? Like what are, that's, that's sort of the Italian, like, term, I think it's sort of a broad term, more than movable, but um, it just, it depends. But yeah, no, I mean, it's a lot of food for thought and we're not, we're not there yet. And there's, you know, hopefully with more, more groups, this is a whole sort of study center in, in Turin that was founded, attempted, they attempted to do it right at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, but, um, but yeah, they're, they're getting there and um, a lot of people will, you know, collectors are involved, uh, makers, um, curators so so hopefully we'll we'll you know get to the bottom of the terminology eventually you know just as soon as we invent you know 12 more th 1200 more things <laughs> to, 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 to ways to do it yeah so you mentioned uh damaged books so when the two of you find something in a collection and you know that there are other libraries that have copies of that book uh you know let's say you know, we're counting back uh, hundreds of years and not dozens. So then are you going to other collections and finding other copies to try to find the fully functioning? Yeah. Oh yeah, that is a very exciting thing that happens. So you can tell things about what people wanted from books by what's missing from them. You have to know how to look for all the other ones. So this has been really useful for me in my research. I'm writing about an obstetrical book from the early 1800s that has one flat plate in it that today would be considered erotic by our standards. And from comparing as many copies of that edition as I can, maybe 30 of them across the world, editions that I know were supposed to have that particular plate in it, I can see the ones that 
where it's missing and where it's torn out. And you say, people really wanted to tear this plate out, this particular plate out. I wonder what was going on with that. So sometimes it helps you solve other kinds of mysteries, which I think you've probably yeah, yeah, the, the, And this the, would be a good women, point for women Suzanne in, to yeah. promote her forbidden Newberry oh, discussion. That's, oh, that's, oh, that's right. Yeah, I, will, I will be talking about quite a few women in barrels with liftable lids uh, on June 1st, uh, yeah, we, among, among other things. But, but no, there's one, there's one in the exhibition that, that the Newberry copy is definitely missing the lid, and you can see glue where it was, and there, there may be three or four copies in the world of this book that still have it. But the same thing with one of the books that I couldn't get a copy of in time for the exhibition is a costume book from the 16th century Italy where there's a Venetian courtesan with a liftable skirt, and often, often it's missing. Uh, she's wearing undergarments, sort of male undergarments and extremely tall shoes under there. Uh, but So there's sort of a different surprise waiting for you, but male undergarments. Uh, but, um, but also sometimes when this, the skirt is still there, you actually get a uh, either the the engraving on the corner is worn away, or there is just a lot of a lot of dirt from fingerprints from the number of times that the curtain has been raised. So uh, you know, you, yeah, you, use is so is so important for the early ones. I mean, I don't I don't know. I mean, Megendorfer, I think, is an example where where it really breaks down. That's a little more modern. That people, I mean, these are these are like like puppetry. It's it's they're really involved, and they've got. You know, wires and strings, it's, it's, it's amazing. And you don't see anything quite that complicated in the 16th, 17th centuries. But, but they're trying to you know, come up with you know, creative ways to, to use just, you know, just string and glue. Yeah. Let's see what we'll, well, we, we talked a little bit about the kinds of things. So anatomy is, is very flap driven. I've got that again. Yeah, there's the eyeball. Sorry, you didn't get a chance to see that yet. Um, we could have a whole other conversation about early plastics and try to decide if that Oculus is, is original. Uh, we've got, you know, this is coming back to, you know, when are pop-ups for kids? When when does that start? Because you, we, the Newbury has a huge collection of ABC books, a lot of which do have pop-up elements. So I, mean, I think that's important, but it's not, it's not a given that this material is going to be you know, for a juvenile audience. Okay, um, oh yeah, can we, like, should we talk about what kinds of books get made right now? Yeah. yeah let me let me jump back for a quick second to the the previous slide. Um, though this transformer is going to blow your mind. Okay. Tell, um, tell us about it. Because we were we had a conversation last week, and Juliet asked the question that she also asked in this evening. You know what what gets covered? What's hard? What do you, what doesn't get covered? And uh, I have a study collection at home, so I'm taking a look at it, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, dinosaurs. Um, uh, though I didn't include the dinosaurs. Sorry, I took that out. Um, because uh, ABC books gets covered. And then I'm thinking, OK, is that because that's what I'm collecting? So that we have a lot of those. There's a lot of ABC books. There's a lot of, um, a lot of holiday books, lots of Christmas books, lots of Halloween books, tons and tons of those. Um, so that's that's what's getting covered for sure. Yeah, I mean, your your amazing counting on the Marsh book is 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 a counting book, one to ten, but it also has this you know, secondary message about the, you know the environment. So there you know there are ways to make it you know kids not kids. Yeah, you know. concept books as we call them yep. in the trade. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So this next slide um, with the transformer. So you know this is. This is a franchise, obviously. And uh, Matthew Reinhardt, whose name you see down here by my hand, um, is the engineer in what's possibly the most brilliant pop-up book um, that's been engineered in the in the in the 21st century. Um, he's he's the top of the game. Like in the U.S., he's the dude. He's the guy that Disney is hiring to do all of the Disney Game of Thrones. Um, Harry Potter, you know, he's worked on all of those franchise books. And uh, he's, he's really good and he's really into it. And, you know, it's such an opportunity for this Transformers because, you know, we're talking about this idea of creating representational movement in a pop-up. And, uh, you know, so you're pulling a tab and you've got this thing and it's transformed into this other thing. So here's, you know, this massive book that's just all these opportunities to transform something. Uh, so let's go with the video.
Bam. So good. It's so good. I'm glad I don't have to try to write how that one works in my work. <laughs> it's just a pull on a hinge. It's just a pull on a hinge. Yeah. Yeah. But it's uh, he's really good at his job. Um, he has had a lot of practice. He's been doing it since he was a young, a young guy. And he's maybe a few years older than I am now, or, or maybe a few years younger. It's fairly close. Um, but you know, it's interesting to think about a project like this, this massively complex, um, retails at 50, 60 bucks, maybe, I think, when I bought it a while back. And uh, you know, the fact that there are you know, plenty of clever engineers out in the world, but there's just so much support and there's so many resources that are behind projects like this that help to make those happen. It's utterly deserving, of course, but you know, it'd be interesting to see what else could happen if someone else got supported. Huh? Yeah, I feel like I've noticed a lot of reticence in the minds of publishers about committing to any, any sort of um, non already immediately recognizable IP. Um, for movable book publishing, because of course this type of structure is so much more expensive and most, I don't wanna say all, but most of it needs to be hand assembled in some way. Um, so publishers who are getting projects thrown at them that, you know, it's, a, it's not a safe bet. It's a, they're interested, but they're, they don't wanna commit. Um, I think those things fall by the wayside a lot. I feel like something I've heard from a lot of publishers is, do you have anything like that, but for a wider market? And, you know, it's w -I -D -E -R. like- W-I-D-E-R. Yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> with a D. Um, and uh, it's like they, they, they really want it, but they just are afraid to, to fund something that could be so expensive and not find a market, especially if it's something that's not intended for children. Um, so I think that's why, you know, a lot of the time it needs the Transformers name behind it to get made. All right, let's, let's go back to one slightly older franchise. Uh, since we're doing the, the close-up here, I wanted to bring it back to uh, Pinocchio and uh, what's actually a dogfish, though I don't really know how they fit in there, uh, though it is a very large fish, uh, rather than a whale. Um, I don't know how many, many of you have seen the, uh, the, the recent uh, Oscar-winning uh, Pinocchio, but that, that doesn't have pop-ups in it. But I just wanted to, to show the, a little bit about how we actually filmed it in motion this whole studio set up and just trying to negotiate an incredibly rickety binding from what is basically the first trademarked pop-up book from 1932, which was the really, really quite late. Uh, people were making structures like this, but nobody actually called it that until, until 1932. Uh, so I think it's, you know, a lot of it is in, in the marketing, you know, do you get you know, enough, enough uh, funding to do a whole series of fairy tales that all have the four uh, pop-ups like that. Um, you know, it, it, but you know, maybe it doesn't matter if the, bind, if the binding breaks immediately after you, after you sell it. But, um, but yeah, so there's conservation issues in holding on to these, but, but they still, I mean, they, they still work to, to a certain extent and I think still really impress people. I mean, you've probably seen that, that whale on, uh, on, on posters around town, it's it's really it's really iconic. But you know, it it, it almost you know it it didn't it didn't have to be. So I don't know I don't know if they I don't know the the history of actual putting those together. I mean, at that point, they probably didn't go to China, but in the 30s. But um, but it certainly is, is more of the handmade uh, elements. So I think we want to wrap up um, just in time for questions. Uh, but is there anything? Oh yeah, there's another. There's a tunnel book. I just put that on the background. Uh, another, uh, another. As we we filmed it upstairs in conservation. 
But um, yeah, it takes a lot of hands to uh, to really really show this safely. Yeah, that's another that's uh, Don Widmer, um, who's you know another Chicago artist who we were really glad to have on the show. Anyway, do the three of you have anything you want to just say in the last couple of minutes before we take questions? Go see the show. It's really good. All right, well, we have, we have some comments as well. Uh, castle books, I have five. I, I, I think that's a great question. Was that someone in the room? No? Okay. Uh, I, I, would love to, I would love to be able to, to balance between in the room and not, so I'm just gonna try to look, look through these. Uh, okay, what is the most basic and effective way to use, utilize paper but is often overlooked because it is so obvious? That's a great question. Um, to me, I think that people are so used to seeing a codex, um, the type of book that, we're, that you're probably the most used to seeing that you find in Barnes and Noble or whatever, that any deviation from that is a surprise. So even if you have um, a page that gate folds out, that folds out one more time than you're used to, um, that can be so effective because it's so surprising. Or a page that opens and then folds up. Um, I would say uh, the answer to that, my answer would be a single fold um, in a page. Something that goes beyond the codex that people are imagining when they open a book uh, is has so much potential for kind of delight and surprise. Um, yeah, it's simple, but you know, it really makes the difference, I think. I would simply agree that, I mean, the codex, the sort of standard book that we think of as booky books, um, is an astonishing technology, you know, in terms of information storage and retrieval that has been matched, obviously, with digital methods, but it has persisted for so long and continues for so long because it's just really good at what it does. I think also when you're designing a book, there are so many pieces of, of that codex structure that people take for granted. Um, and not all of it has to be expensive or, or complicated. Um, I have something in the book I'm working on right now where there's kind of a code, uh, there's a constellation page where there's an illustrated constellation. And if you take the ribbon bookmark that's in lots of books and you kind of pass it over the page, it spells out a word. Um, so it's like a code that you have to kind of solve. Um, and I think my, my inspiration behind that was that there's this kind of piece just hanging off of a lot of books. Like how many people really use a ribbon bookmark? Like a lot. Uh, I don't, I kind of ignore it. Um, but taking something that people are used to seeing and using it for an interesting purpose, um, I think is a, a great way to involve movability animation um, in a book without kind of breaking the bank. So you're putting the code in codex. Exactly, yeah. in the code in codex. I just want to quickly say that's such a good question. Whoever asked that, I, I love that, and I'm going to be thinking about it, but I think people throughout history agree with you both that the fold, the single fold, can do so much. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about those sneaky objects that look so simple but are really doing complicated things that make you try to look into the intellectual history of the time, like what images are on either side of that fold? Where's the text? What's the text telling you to do with it? Open it, how? So if we had another hour, I could give you so many different kinds of folds throughout history that are, are doing the surprising sneaky things that Hannah and Sean are talking about. Yeah, I wish we'd been able to include uh, some Mad Magazine fold-ins in the exhibition. There's a, there's a book on the shelf in the back that's got some examples. Uh, uh, so that, yeah, very simple, but so so effective. All right, let's move on quickly to another question. Um, the two book historians know the importance of resurrecting and reading a book's use. Can the builders engineers talk about how they anticipate material use of an interaction with their books? I mean, what are you what are you willing to live with? And what do you expect, you know, just what are you trying to like stave off in terms of total destruction? I guess I'm, I added that last bit. Ultimately, it, it's it's a mood point. Uh, you know, paper uniquely serves my needs 
and I recognize that it's an ephemeral material and that there are conservators in the world who like to address the problems that I create. So <laughs> I just do my thing, right? Hope for the best. Yeah, I think I am kind of a perfectionist in terms of I want, I know people are going to be touching my book a lot and moving it and maybe trying to break it. <laughs> um, and I really want to prevent that. But ultimately, it is paper. And if people are going to try to brute force something, they're going to do it. Um, that's been a, uh, a concern with this project I've been talking about because I'm kind of inviting people. There's a lot of like puzzles to be solved in it. And I'm inviting people to try to break the book. There's a, a page in it that's like a, a safe that locks and unlocks. And you have to unlock the safe to get the ending of the book. And I know there are people that are going to rip that puppy apart the second they get to that page. Like, I'm not doing all that. and <laughs> Just rip it. And that's fine. Um, I think they, uh, there are always going to be... Uh, you know, this medium in particular is always going to deteriorate faster than a lot of other media. And uh, it's about getting to a place of acceptance. <laughs> and encouraging everyone to buy two copies of everything. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Now, one of the uh, uh, other title options for the exhibition was to have a uh, prefix called Movable Mayhem. Uh, because of the the way that you just lose all these parts and uh, you know the the naughty kittens in their pop-up classroom are just you know shredding everything and get their hands on but you know putting that together with an assortment of of children's books printed on fabric was just another attempt at making books indestructible but they really shouldn't be they should be used so I think that's sort of one thing to take away though I do like the idea of buying in, in multiple all right. Um, Pay for safety. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, we've got a couple more minutes. Uh, given the complexity and multifaceted experience of making a pop up book, what might be the implications be in healthcare? For example, in art therapy used for patients with dementia or children with mental health challenges? Uh, thank you. I mean, there's, I think the show actually, people are responding to it with a lot of nostalgia. So, I mean, that's already a pleasant aspect of it, but I don't know. I mean, and there's a lot of sort of healthcare-ish applications and sort of general knowledge, I don't know, modifiers over the, over the ages, although the, the woman is always pregnant, which is sort of a thing uh, we can disagree with. Although I did, I did see a, uh, a full, full man-sized mannequin recently at, at Yale that uh, was was equal opportunity. I think it was just it was just it had a male head, but it was, it, but it also had a, had a uterus. So um, some sometimes you you know you've got to have all the options. But but I don't know. But but actually, but in terms of you know improving mental health, I didn't know what whether our artist wanted to say or Julia to do about something. Yeah, just, just quickly, that there's a long history of making and remaking movable books as a therapeutic practice or as something that really helps you kind of meditatively absorb an idea or learn a concept. And I think there's this notion that if you slow down and use your hands and your eyes in a different way than you're used to uh, in your everyday life, that you'll be able to learn something differently or concentrate on something differently. Like This is what they're thinking around 1800, 1850. It's probably not that romantic. I wonder if um, you think that you absorb things or learn things differently when you're making them, or if there is that kind of therapeutic potential, like this question really interestingly asked. I think the number of times I've cut the end of my finger off doing paper crafts would say <laughs> would say no. But um, yeah, actually, my my partner's mom has Parkinson's and getting into paper crafts and uh, card making and, and pop-up style work is something that her healthcare team has advised and something that, you know, every time I'm over at their house now, I'm like, oh, what are you working on? And we'll kind of do stuff to, like that together. And I think um, any any sort of um, way that you can engage the way that your, your mind and your body work together uh, and this is a great way to do so, is, is going to be beneficial in some way or another, um, either to your mental health or your physical health or both. 
All right, let's go for another earlier one. Uh, thoughts about the relationship between the popularity of fantastic mechanical figurines and pop-ups in early modern Europe. So do we do we think the, I guess, is it just me? Oh, okay, I'll, be, I'll try to be fast. Uh, I mean, I do, I do think there, in, in, the, in the exhibition, we have a, um, a fact, very large facsimile of a 15th century woodcut of two monkeys that uh, when you spin the, uh, the dial 90 degrees, they, they change places. So they're either on the horse or they're hanging off of a bar. I mean, I think that that more relates to toys. It's not a full on automaton that would say, you know, walk or you know, play chess or something like that. I don't think, I don't think in the early period they necessarily would be as complicated as clockwork necessarily, but but you are looking at instruments like uh, astrolabes, which are which are very complicated and trying to replicate that in paper. So it maybe is not so much figural as as instrument based, where you're doing that and. Uh, and, and don't get me started on the you know the the, the articulated brass arm and the uh, the fifteenth century calendars that can you can use to tell time anywhere across the world you know you can change the latitude so they they can get pretty complicated yeah all right I'll find one more that is not self serving uh, <laughs> all right let's let's end with uh, when is the use of a pop up gratuitous when is the use of a pop up gratuitous I mean yeah, yes yes again June first. Uh, <laughs> never. Never up. Yeah, I think that's, it kind of brings us full circle around to like, you know, art questions that have been hashed over a million times. You know, when is the um, use of a certain medium gratuitous or what are the inherent um, qualities of a medium that mean that you should or shouldn't use it? I think are questions that are ultimately subjective um you know there are a ton of arguments either way but i think that pop-ups the i guess the um the supposition that a pop-up might be gratuitous kind of could apply to any piece of art you know when is a painting gratuitous when is a, a comic gratuitous when is a print gratuitous um, art is kind of gratuitous um, in a lot of ways. Um, I think it's still worthwhile, though. Do, do you want to do you want to talk about your your quandary in the current book project? Oh, which one? <laughs> the the the, uh, the the that involves a head. Oh yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, the project I'm working on right now is for adults, and I know pop ups are often relegated to the the realm of being for children, but this one is definitely not, and I was writing to my editor the other day um, because a lot of people die in the book, often very horribly. Um, somebody gets impaled by a bull and somebody gets their head pulled off, and I was saying, you know, I, the book is fully illustrated, um, and it's a pop-up movable book, so where's the line here, you know? can I illustrate and have a guy getting his head ripped off in the book? And they said, oh yeah, sure, do, do whatever you want. Um, <laughs> and I said, okay, well, you know, I'm just worried that because it's a pop-up book, like children will, and they were like, our marketing department will make sure no child buys your book. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, thank God for that. Um, so yeah, I think, if you want to see a gratuitous pop-up book, wait for um, the fall of 2025 and, uh, and buy my book. <laughs> we, we, we can't wait. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, your, your great answers uh, this evening. And thank you all for coming. Uh, there's a, a shameless plug for uh, continuing to support the humanities behind me. Uh, please come back for uh, Forbidden Pop-Up Books, which is not going to be uh, recorded, so I can say whatever I want uh, and show you what, whatever I want, so be warned. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you're not already on our mailing list, please join us. And uh, please uh, you know, go back to the galleries uh, if you uh, haven't had enough time in the show. It'll be up until July 15th, but uh, you know, it's fun. All right.